We're here in Geneva to look at preparations for the World Summit for the Information Society. Behind me in these UN buildings, they're working on policies and strategies to try to ensure that information and communications technology, things like mobile phones and the Internet, are of benefit to all humanity, that all the world, sooner rather than later, has fair access. The Internet is 35 years old this year, but 9 out of 10 people still have no access. And while millions in the developed world are reaping the benefits of enhanced communications and technology, it would seem the world's poor and unconnected have not yet been helped very much. In fact, some argue that these advances in communications are accelerating the gap between the poor and the rich. Others take the view that investing in health care, a safe water supply and food security is the priority. In their view, the Internet and indeed other components of the communications universe, such as mobile phones, radio and television, have at best a supporting role in making poverty history. First things first, they contend. For instance, how can any of the new technologies operate properly when there are no reliable sources of power in the rural areas and shanty towns of the developing world? And yet there is powerful evidence that where access and services provided meet local needs, they are taken up and work to the benefit of the disadvantaged. One entrepreneur who shares this view is the founder of Infosys, India's software giant. I do believe that we have to bring the power of information technology, power of internet to the remote areas. Unless we can bridge this digital divide, I don't think we'll be able to succeed today as a nation that has high aspirations. For some villages, there are new solutions to the power problem. Emailing adopted with enthusiasm in the Solomon Islands. In other communities like this one in Mali, the facilities are even more flexible. In Honduras, connecting farmers with their customers improved both business and farming practice and academic standards have improved dramatically in schools in the Kyrgyz Republic lucky enough to be the beneficiaries of an aid project. The skeptics say that these are pilot schemes destined to remain isolated examples of what could be. The technology is too expensive and will remain forever out of reach of the poor until the market allows. In fact the most hardline believe in the digital deluge only when the market meets all our needs rich and poor. But in the governments of the developing world especially, that confidence in the market is not shared. They see closing the digital divide as an indispensable weapon in the battle to close the breach between rich and poor worlds. Welcome to our digital dividends debate. Today we're focusing here on one principle overall, and that is, is there a digital dividend which is going to lift the poor out of poverty? Do you have a view about this? Do you have a feel for what they need? Um, speaking from my experience, which is of SEVA and which is about 32 years old organization, I think ICT, any technology can help, any tool can help if there is an organization. And poor feel more connected when they get that technology to them in their already established work. Walter Faust, what what is your view? Do you know, do you have a feel from the work you've done in the field for what is actually needed out there as opposed to what we think might be nice? I would say yes, there is knowledge what they want, but it will never be for all time. But present time, they want to have access to information. They do not want to remain marginalized. They want to go for innovative use of technologies. The principal barrier is cost, the affordability of these systems. So what are we going to do to bring costs down? It is, yeah, it's, it's, it's really very simple. What most people in the world still have never done is that they've never made a phone call. Most people actually need to talk. But they can't afford to. They can't uh, afford the, the, to the, make the, the, a phone the, call. I'll, so I'll, no I'll, come, I'll come to the affordability. But talking about, talking about what is needed, I think we are sometimes drawing too much on our own recent experience of broadband internet access and satellite communications and three-dimensional modeling 
of data in real time on our PCs, and we think that this is what everybody needs. For a lot of people, for most people in the world, the first truly big step, the giant step for them, is making a phone call. And, uh, and, and if we lose sight of this simple fact that sometimes being able to call from a village to the urban center is more dramatic in terms of economic impact than actually surfing the internet, uh, then we lose sight of reality. When it comes to the affordability, though, I think, I think that we are very rapidly heading in this direction. Prior to the, at the, at the previous uh, WUSIS in Geneva, in 2003, uh, Mr. Ollila, my boss at Nokia, said that, that from a technology affordability point of view, the private sector will enable half the world's population digital access to voice and internet by the year 2050. So that's like a pledge and say, this is what we can do. That would be four billion people. Now, today we have two billion, right? So we are two billion, we're ahead of track right now. So the cost there is coming down dramatically. You've raised a very important point there. Perhaps someone here would like to speak to this. The barrier is, is it not, in some areas, the state telecommunications monopolies, is that the case? Certainly, we need to bring down the cost. That is one reason why, in most developing countries, the telephone systems should be transferred from the public domain, that is the government domain, to a lot of private players. Once the competition sets in, the prices will fall down, as it has happened in India recently. Uh, Pinder Wong from Hong Kong, let me just jump in here, because I mean, there's, a, there's a great emphasis here on technologies, and it seems as if we're saying technologies are like a silver bullet. And services, too. Right, but technologies change. I mean, before it was voice, and now it's the internet, and now we know what, sort of what's next. There was an earlier question in terms of not just cost, but the role of, for example, governments. Mm. Now, being in Hong Kong, and, and as I tried to pioneer internet services in Hong Kong, over the last 10 years, we've gone from zero to hero in a decade. And what was a key result of that is a very forward-looking um, regulator and administrator. So the role of government should not be underplayed. The role of a progressive government and finding out what is necessarily applicable and suitable for their particular environment, that emphasis should not be uh, understated. Okay. Another comment here, perhaps? This lady has the microphone. In many parts of Africa, um, we know that women have been disadvantaged in terms of uh, using technologies, both old technologies, for example, radio, and uh, new technologies. But we've seen um, innovative ways that they've been able to use these uh, technologies to uh, be more appropriate to their circumstances. For example, using mobile phone SMSs uh, to access prices for markets mm -hmm. so that that in the end also um, raises their livelihoods. Yeah. Could, could I throw this open to people involved perhaps in funding for development? If I were to give you, if I were to offer you uh, $100 million to spend on an, a national project, what would you choose to spend it on? Would you choose to spend it on developing new technologies appropriate to the environment? Would you spend it on software relevant to the context in which it's needed? Or would you spend it on training? Where are the greatest gains per spend of dollar used? See, for instance, we talk, we, you asked the question of how, where would we spend $100 million. The, we would try to increase access to people. In Bangladesh, where we established Gramin Phone, it has given access to all the rural people. We're not that worried about contents because people talk to themselves. And so by creating access, they themselves can decide what content to reach. I would invest in building capacity among the local people to create content which is relevant to their lives. When uh, uh, Namrata Bali mentioned how relevant her remark is that poor people by definition do not have the luxury like us here to go and walk two, two, two kilometers or three kilometers to just access information. They are living hand to mouth. Therefore, they will go to a place to learn, to be able to do better, to empower themselves with knowledge and information so that they can produce better, so that they can, so they, they can contribute to the economy. So that is the answer. 